My name is Emily Click, and I serve here in a couple of roles. I'm Assistant Dean for Ministry Studies, and teach a couple of classes, and also administer the program. So I'm speaking to you today from my role um, as running the field education program here at Harvard Divinity School. First of all, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring us with being here. And um, what I see as my job today is to help you get the information that you need to make a really good decision about where you might apply if, after today, you decide you do want to do theological education. Um, that's the sort of bigger question. So uh, for just a little bit here, I, I'm going to kind of tell you about field education and where it fits into theological education. Um, and then um, the most of the time we'll be listening to much more interesting people, our students and supervisor, um, who will tell you from their point of view, their stories about field education. Um, but let me just encourage you to listen to your heart all throughout this day. You're all, most of you have pens in hand, cause mainly because we gave you one, um, and <laughs> <laughs> pads of paper, and you're writing down, and you're thinking, thinking, thinking. But you really need to listen to your heart. You may resonate with what the students tell you about this place and the faculty tell you, um, or you may not. And you need to listen to that. You know, what kind of is working here for you? Um, so that's why I say it's my job to kind of, you know, open the windows, let you see in, because I'm really speaking to your heart as well as your head. So I want to begin with what is ministry. Um, we talk about ministry in a very strange way here at HDS. And it's not uncommon for us to hear from new arrivals of students who matriculate. Within about a week, they come into my office and they say, I now understand what you mean by ministry. And so it'd be nice for you to have that idea a little earlier so it can help inform um, your decision-making process. So here, here I'm going to try. You guys might correct me with your own modifications, because that would be helpful. Um, so ministry, the way we see it, is you cultivating the gifts that are part of being Gabriel and figuring out how to offer those in service to the needs of the world. And I'm adding this. You haven't heard me say this part of it before. Um, standing being present, journeying with others, and doing some interpretive work about where is the presence of God in the midst of that? Where is the resonance with deep human values? How does one kind of begin to work on not knowing, beginner's mind? You know, how can you bring some of these ideas that you study in school here in the classrooms and so forth to be of use as you are offering in service to others. And mind you, that's a two-way street. Um, it's not as if all these poor people out there just have nothing and you're going to just come with golden words of wisdom. Um, you're going to be listening first and foremost and bringing what you hear from them um, into the classroom to hopefully straighten up some of us faculty and get us understanding things a little better. Yeah, that was, you can laugh, that's all right. <laughs> so I have, a, I have four I's, like the letter I. <laughs> I only have two in my face, but, well, no. <laughs> that was unintentional. <laughs> uh, probably I had boys calling me four eyes when I was in high school. <laughs> all right, so, uh, field education is integrative learning, okay? So what we see field ed as fitting into the HDS degree, whether it's MTS or MDiv, you are welcome if you're pursuing an MTS to do field ed or the MDiv, is, as I was just describing, bringing ideas into places 
where there's a lot of human need and trying to work those ideas out, bringing the insights that you have from the settings into the classroom and so forth. We do see field education as work. You are going and doing work to help an organization that needs your hands, your heart, and your feet, and your brilliant minds. However, uh, for me, that's not the number one thing that I think about with field ed. The number one thing is learning. It is a learning opportunity for you. But here's the way in which I think about that learning. If field ed works the way I always dream of for students and hope, they are developing their imagination in that setting. You're cultivating an imagination. Now, you might say, well, that's nice, but I, I'm not quite sure how, how that fits in. But for my thinking about ministry in the future, you need to have ripe, full imaginations that are deeply informed by human history and by what you experience when you meet people in need. Um, I don't know where ministry is going. I myself am an ordained Christian minister. I've served in two different congregations. And I do believe that congregations will continue to exist, uh, Protestant congregations. But that's one slice of what ministry is going to be in the future. And there are many other ways in which we need you to become, here's another I, innovators. We um, have a class, so my co good colleague in field education who's going to stand up and wave at all of you so you can see her, <laughs> Laura Tuak. She is being applauded by the students because she is a wonderful mentor and guide to so many students. She's been co-teaching a class on innovation in ministry um, with Dudley Rose, who you saw at the last panel. And so we know that it's going to be important to be innovative, whether you're in a historic uh, Christian church, such as you're going to hear about from one of our grads who's now a Lutheran minister, or whether you're in a very new and innovative setting. Um, we are here, as you've heard, interfaith, multi-faith, which includes folks who very happily um, wear a moniker called their nuns, not spelled N-U-N. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we have folks who embrace religious traditions that may be ancient, who embrace traditional rituals and ways of expressing um, what it is that's really significant to them. And we have folks who are deeply called and motivated out of a sense of human value and the importance of morals and ethics. Um, and so everything you do in Field Dead, even if you are deeply steeped in a setting that is from an ancient tradition, will have some kind of interfaith dimension to it. We believe that where you are headed to do your ministries, you're going to be in a context that's interfaith. That's who's all around you. The next door neighbor is, you know, eating from a different, you know, set of guidelines than you are. And to understand that, to respect that, to value that is something we hope for from all of our graduates. So that leads me to just my concluding um, point before I introduce our panel. So yeah, I was getting you ready, Eric. Yeah. Soon I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, and this is that some of you are shopping um, a number of different schools for your MDiv. You should. If you're not, you should do that. And one of the things that you should do when you visit different schools for MDiv is really scrutinize field ed and how it works there. Um, you can read all about our field ed program online. You can come and meet with us, ask us tons of questions, because you will find that field ed is dramatically different in different settings. So just two other unique things about HDS that so far as I know, and this, it, it's, it may, we not, may not be the only program in the U.S., but we're one of very few, if any, who can work out that you can make your work study allotment in your field ed um, placement, if your placement is eligible for work study, which religious um, places of religious worship are not. But if you are working in a 
food pantry or a shelter um, and a school program and you're eligible for work study, you can get paid through the work study program. And I think that's not only been revolutionary for our students, but also for Boston. Because we have a long tradition of having our students go out and work in these settings that could never afford to hire them. And they work on the work study program and it really boosts some of these um, organizations that are really struggling to have the labor they need to do the work that's so important. We also have a very significant international field ed program. We don't have any students on our panel who participated in this, but last summer we had um, two students in France. We had one who was at um, Thich Nhat Hanh's place, Plum Village, which was right smack dab in the middle of France. We had a student who was working in an Anglican parish in the south of France in Nice. We had a student who was in Rome um, working with a news organization to um, film various Vatican events in virtual reality film and put them on the web so that people can get back into these settings. And, and he's, his vision is he's kind of the Johnny Appleseed of um, the virtual reality for millennials to understand what is possible in terms of worship. Um, anyway, those, those are some examples of what we've had students do in the summer and we have funding for that. Okay, now for the really interesting part, which is our <laughs> students. Uh, thank you for listening, and I, although I'm not able to be at the lunch, um, I'll be around. My door will be open. Okay, let me introduce our students so that I can get out of the way. First student is Eric Bussey. Am I pronouncing that right? Um, who is a Buddhist student. But um, he, while, after he first came here, he took a little time and wandered over across the river to Harvard Medical School and now has a Master of Bioethics. Did you really have to go across the river to do that? Yes, really he did. did. <laughs> it's a long way, but he made it, okay. Um, also, he has done field education in a, ho a hospital on this side of the river, and that was a, a straight you know, interfaith chaplain at Mount Auburn Hospital. He's also worked for the Braxton Institute planning a conference on moral injury and collective healing for veterans and for formerly incarcerated people. He is now at Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. I'll let him tell you more about that. Next to him is Isaac Martinez, who is an Episcopalian student, and the Episcopalians get the award for having the coolest words for where you are in your ordination <laughs> process. <laughs> He's a postulant for ordination in the Edu Episcopal Diocese for Massachusetts. He's doing his first field ed this year at St. Michael's Episcopal in Marblehead and recently preached his first sermon there. Yes. So um, next to him is Sally Fris Rhymes with itchy. Fr Fritchie. <laughs> Thank you. I know Sally well. She's doing her senior paper with me, and uh, she's fantastic. Um, she's a Unitarian Universalist and is at Suffolk University, or was at Suffolk University at their interfaith chaplaincy, uh, and also did clinical pastoral education, which you will never hear referred to as clinical pastoral education. You will always hear it as CPE at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Next to her is Sam Melton, who is a Lutheran. And we don't get to call you a postulant or something cool like that, right? No, candidate. No. She's a candidate. Awesome. Um, <laughs> for ordination. And she is at Good Shepherd Lutheran in Quincy, and we have invited her supervisor, <laughs> Am I saying that wrong? No, I'm just... I'm she gave a woo-hoo. Woo, yes. <laughs> I'm introducing Alyssa, who just was, was going woo. Um, Alyssa is a um, MDiv graduate from here, um, uh, graduated in 2013. So she has living proof that you can come through HDS and be ordained as a Lutheran pastor. So she's there at Good Shepherd Lutheran in Quincy. And um, again, I introduce my wonderful colleague, Laura Tuak, who was also available to let you know more about Field Dead. 
and we have a whole staff in our office um, who are all at your service. Eric, take it away. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. I hope you're staying warm. <laughs> I'm not. Um, yeah, so just to add a little bit of nuance to my own uh, spiritual identity, I'm uh, a bad Buddhist and a lazy Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> so those are official categories. Um, and what I would like to convey to you in terms of my field education experience is how HDS um, has allowed me to shamelessly embrace the uh, deep but delicious ambiguity of my uh, vocational aspirations. Um, rather than being an opportunity to cultivate really specific skill sets or expertise for a uh, determined career path, um, really what this uh, educational experience has evolved into for me is a, is a kind of opportunity to test different vocational hypotheses. Um, <laughs> and so in that uh, vein, when I first came in, I was um, quite committed to uh, what my capacities might be in the sort of micro level work on, on caring for an individual human being. Um, and so I thought that clinical chaplaincy would be um, the route that I would go down as a uh, career trajectory. And so to test that hypothesis, I went to Mount Auburn Hospital, which um, is smaller than you'll hear, much smaller than you'll hear about uh, with Brigham and Women's or MGH or any of the other fantastic uh, clinical sites you can go to. But that small experience was actually quite um, valuable for me because it gave me a very, very intense close relationship with my supervisor. And um, you get to know the nuances of each floor um, quite intimately. And so that experience was um, very positive and, and deeply transformative. Uh, however, what it also did is um, gave me a window into seeing how the healthcare industrial complex is a deep source of suffering for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so once I had uh, seen this or gotten a taste of this, I, I couldn't escape it. <laughs> and so I plunged into that world and then pursued uh, studies in bioethics at the medical school. Uh, and then coming back across the river, so just questing across the river, um, I was able to leverage the resources of HDS yet again to parlay my thesis work uh, from the bioethics program into a summer uh, student-initiated field ed placement, which was with uh, the Braxton Institute and also uh, in a collaboration with the Library of Congress uh, with their Office of Scholarly Programs. Because um, I wanted to sort of test the hypothesis of what it would be like to be a, a researcher and activist um, trying to do these work, this kind of work at a policy uh, and organizing level. Uh, and so I did um, research in support of organizing this advanced training seminar on moral injury and collective healing at Princeton, um, which brought a lot of thought leaders who are working at these intersections together with helpers all kinds of helpers and healers to, to really think about what are the implications um, for military service if the VA is statistically validating this concept of moral injury and how does this also pertain to any number of um, uh, wounded and wounding systems in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the HDS Office of Ministry Studies was extremely generous in co-sponsoring that uh, conference as well. So there's a lot of sharing of um, resources. Um, however, the, and that experience was also deeply uh, positive and transformative. Um, uh, but it was sort of mixed in together with the election of 45 last November. And, um, so I, I was really attuned to how I was just thinking about uh, the questions that I'm digging into uh, seem so fantastic and so rooted um, that I wasn't sure that working on, a, on the level of policy conventionally construed or this kind of uh, organizing work was the best use of my capacities for facing these problems in the most open, honest, uh, and fully with uh, the fullness of my integrity. Um, and so I was looking for an opportunity to root my work again in the lives of, of concrete individuals and people in a way that was like as morally audacious as, as I could find. And so I am now in the process of reclaiming my identity as a teacher and educator. I don't think it gets more audacious than that <laughs> um, with all that is ahead. 
Um, and so now I'm at working, did another student-initiated placement with this wonderful organization called Inward Bound Mindfulness Education, um, who, and they're a nonprofit group uh, that are very committed to equity. They've never turned a teen away for lack of funds. Um, and essentially, uh, they have the word mindfulness in their name, and they do use a variety of contemplative practices to um, foster self-compassion and self-awareness and emotional regulation in teens, but it's not for, the, for uh, stress reduction alone. They are very interested in cultivating uh, ethical leaders who are interested in creating a more just and caring world. Um, and so that's where I'm at now, which has been, which has been amazing so far. Uh, and so that's all just to say that um, my vocational ambiguity persists. Um, but the fact that HDS has this infrastructure to allow you to be un deeply unapologetic about this, and that there's such a breadth of resources available that they make sure you're paid for, <laughs> um, has been um, just invaluable in my own spiritual discernment about how I can best address suffering in the world, um, as well as uh, marrying that with the, the professional uh, qualifications that will be necessary in doing that work. It's so fascinating. I want to be on more of these panels so I can listen to <laughs> my colleagues. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Isaac. Um, and as Emily said, I'm in the ordination process to be a priest in the Episcopal Church. Um, and uh, my story of field ed starts um, last summer when I was preparing to come here, um, or summer before last, uh, before my first year. Um, and a very senior priest um, in our diocese uh, pulled me aside after a committee meeting and was telling me, oh, you know, you're going to HDS, that's great, but you have to be careful because they don't do formation well there. Um, and had I, you know, had a year and a half under my belt of HDS, I could have, you know, asked him, like, oh, what do you mean by that? Um, but uh, I just carried that, um, that remark with me um, into my first year um, and, and really wrestled with what, what does it mean to be formed, um, to be shaped, to be a minister, um, here, here at HDS. Um, and I'm very fortunate um, that uh, I came to the Episcopal Church um, in, in a kind of roundabout way. Um, I grew up Pentecostal back home in New Mexico uh, and, and left that tradition um, uh, because of its uh, incompatibility with my uh, notorious homosexual lifestyle. Um, and... <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, was, was a, a spiritual but not religious, for lack of a better term, uh, person for, for most of my young adulthood. Um, and it was because of uh, programs um, uh, started by Episcopalians, HDS alums, um, uh, that, that innovated, that thought deeply about what does it mean to be a faithful Christian in these times. Um, and so they started programs um, like Life Together, which is uh, an internship program um, in our diocese for young um, who are asking those same questions, um, and the Leadership Development Initiative, uh, which sought to develop leaders using community organizing methods taught by Marshall Gans over at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, and, um, and The Crossing, which is a community of young adults that meets um, at our cathedral in downtown Boston. And all of these programs uh, were started by, um, by ordained, uh, ordained Episcopalians um, who had their MDivs and MTSs um, from, um, from HDS. Um, and that was my introduction into the Episcopal Church. Um, and so I came here um, uh, wanting to continue that, wanting to continue that conversation. Um, and, um, and as HDS becomes increasingly diverse and increasingly committed to nurturing that diversity um, as much as the Christian tradition has been nurtured here, um, really wanting to engage um, with uh, with my colleagues from different traditions, because that is, I really, I really do think, the future um, of America. Um, and, uh, and, and concretely with, with Field Ed, so I, I've had this, um, you know, this experience with innovative ministry in various forms, um, but, uh, and, and have been um, 
have had some experience in, in sort of traditional, um, traditional parishes, um, for lack of a better word, um, uh, sponsored by one uh, out of in Porter Square here in Cambridge, um, a great congregation. Um, uh, and my bishop told me, you know, you can go to HDS, you don't have to do what they call an Anglican year, which is a year of specialized study um, at another seminary afterwards, but you have to do your field ed um, at Episcopal parishes. Um, so I was like, okay, um, that's a broad enough rubric that I can, I can make this work for me. Um, and fortunately, um, uh, uh, talking with Emily and with Laura over the summer, um, who gave me just some really great advice, um, because I had, um, I had an opportunity to do something really innovative. Um, there was a church in Lynn um, that got a grant from the National Episcopal Church to start a Hispanic ministry. Um, and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to be part of that. I'd worked with this church. I really respected the rector. Um, and, uh, and I thought this would be great. Um, uh, but there's also a lot of uncertainty. Um, the rector ended up uh, announcing that she was leaving before the year would be out. Um, and, um, and really, in, in deep conversation and deep discernment with, um, with the field ed office, was able to discern that um, as exciting as that was, that wasn't the right place for me. Um, and had uh, was looking at other opportunities um, and had worked with this church that I'm in at Marblehead um, uh, with, uh, with LDI, the Leadership Development Initiative, and the program I used to run there, um, and deeply respected the rector there. You know, it's a, St. Michael's is a lovely place. It's a 303-year-old congregation, and it takes a lot of pride in being a 303-year-old congregation. Um, and, and at the same time, um, that there were, there were aspects of ministry um, that I could learn there, and especially as um, the Episcopal Church, you know, not trying to put a, too good of a gloss on it, but it's, it's dying, it's a dying church. Um, and yet, um, you know, my faith speaks very deeply um, that, that the way through life and through greater love is through death. Um, and so, um, what does it mean to, um, to serve a place like that, to learn at a place like that? Um, and, um, and I'm fortunate that the, um, uh, the rector there, um, my supervisor, my field ed supervisor, sees this. He knows this. He's not blind to it. Um, and um, and already, you know, it's been what eight weeks um, since I've been there, um, and um, have have learned what it means to take risks um, in a place like that, in a place where the history might seem oppressive, um, but is really, um, uh, you know, they're just people. They're just people who want to hear. Um, want to hear the good news, um, and um, I've been able to, to participate in that, um, and we'll continue to learn from that, um, and you know, hope, and maybe next year we'll do something a little bit more innovative. But for this year, um, I'm really excited to be um, at, at at St. Michael's in Marblehead, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about that. As Emily said, my name is Sally. Um, I am a third year here, so I've completed both my units of field ed. I did one part-time through all of last school year uh, at Suffolk University at their Interfaith Chaplaincy Center. I'm considering a, a call to campus chaplaincy uh, as a UU minister, and I'm still, still deciding about whether I want to go in that direction versus parish ministry. Um, so that was a valuable experience. And then this past summer, I did a unit of CPE at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, which I absolutely would not have done if it was not required of me. Um, I, I was scared out of my mind to be a hospital chaplain, um, but it turned out to be just an incredible experience, very, very supportive environment. Um, got me through it, and I, I learned a lot about myself. Um, so I would recommend CPE specifically to anyone who is scared of it. Uh, and that kind of gets to my point about field ed. I think one of the hardest things and most important things is to get yourself out of kind of the applicant mindset, um, the interviewee mindset of kind of where you're, where you're at now. Uh, at least where I was at in your position is you, you have to project a certain level of confidence and competence that you're trying to like prove to schools that you belong there. Um, 
But field ed is an opportunity to play to your weaknesses, uh, to really look honestly at what you don't know about and what you're not good at. Um, and that you might not, if it was just a job, you might not get chosen to do it mm -hmm. um, because you don't have the qualifications and you don't have the experience. Um, and it's a chance to, to get those things and to really pay attention to those gaps uh, in, in what you're comfortable with. Uh, that's really, really what it was for me. Um, another thing, just, uh, <laughs> I, don't think I, I don't think I've actually shared this with Emily and Laura before, but during my first year, I didn't understand how field ed worked. I kind of thought you just like got an interesting position somewhere and then like got, it counted as field ed somehow. <laughs> um, so my first summer after, after my first year here, I got an interesting position somewhere. I worked as a, a summer camp director for the Audubon Society. Mm. Um, it wasn't field ed at all. Uh, and I realized, you know, by the time, like, you know, summer was starting, I was like, this isn't how this works. Not even a little bit. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it was, it absolutely was a very formative experience for me. Um, and so one thing I would encourage is to take, to, to split up your field ed into one during a school year, one during a summer, because it does leave those open spaces um, kind of in your three years here to try things that are, outside of kind of a typical ministry experience um, that might not be kind of like part of a streamlined career trajectory um, because that is part of what I think is gonna let us you know, innovate is to get experiences that are not really typical ministry experiences and, and to integrate them back into our education. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions specifically about CPE. Um, I definitely went into it being very intimidated in a way that I don't think people have to be. I, I would love to demystify and make it a little less scary for anyone who, who has questions about that. Thank you, mm -hmm. you Sally. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, I am Sam. I am currently a field ed student at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in North Quincy, which is right outside of Boston. Um, it is... Um, wonderful and quirky and my supervisor is amazing and I am not just saying that because she's sitting right here. Um, <laughs> my story or my narrative about field ed I think actually starts here. Uh, I was also in DivX and I spent a lot of time thinking about what it was that I wanted out of a theological education and part of that decision was what field ed would look like at different institutions for me and um, very wisely took Emily's advice on that and thought about what it, what it was I was looking for in my own development and my own understanding of my vocation. And part of that, uh, I think, starts even earlier. I converted to Lutheranism when I was in middle school or high school. And I spoke last week at noon service about um, trying really hard to not be Lutheran. <laughs> and I part of that was in my theological education, deciding between a traditional Lutheran seminary and a divinity school like Harvard. And one of the reasons I chose not to go to a traditional seminary was that it didn't seem to fit me. Um, I, I don't fit the, the box of a typical, I think, Lutheran pastor, or what that might look like. And so for me, HDS was this answer of being able to sort of keep one foot in and one foot out of that Lutheran box. Um, and also HDS kind of gave me a smooth way out of the Lutheran ordination process if I wanted it. And um, fast forward to my second year, I am very much Lutheran and at the <laughs> most traditional Lutheran congregation you could probably find. Um, so that did not work well. Um, <laughs> all of that is to say that HDS is a really neat place to give you some time to be in these Im ambiguous areas to figure out what, what kind of faith, um, if any, you're looking to find. And if you're committed to a tradition, it, it gives you space to dive really deeply into that as well. And so for me, uh, when I started thinking about field ed last year, I looked at several different congregations. Um, University Lutheran and Harvard Square is doing really amazing sanctuary work and is the dream social justice congregation. Um, but for me, also being in a dying denomination wasn't realistic. Um, that's probably not the type of congregation I will have the opportunity to serve whenever I'm done. And so I was looking for a more realistic uh, opportunity and I found my way to Good Shepherd. 
And I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, what I wanted that community to look like. And I wasn't looking for a strictly blue or red congregation, but I wanted something that was mixed and politically, uh, theologically, and a place where I could see some real opportunity for work. Um, and so, so when I came to Good Shepherd, um, I did what you're not supposed to do and started becoming a member before I um, started Field Ed, so don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> and got to really know the community a lot before I actually started Field Ed, which was helpful for me in understanding what this, uh, what this congregation had to offer to me as, as a candidate and as someone learning how to do congregational ministry, but also what kind of gifts or skills I could offer them as well. Um, and, and all of that kind of goes together in me trying to figure out if congregational ministry is even right for me. Um, a part of me was hoping that I would get to Good Shepherd and they would tell me I was really terrible at this and I could just leave. He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and two months in, that has not happened yet. <laughs> um, but it's, it's given me a chance to see that traditional congregational ministry can be done by people like uh, Pastor Alyssa, who had this education at HGS and had these really creative and innovative experiences that guide and shape what they're doing in this traditional context in a dying, a dying church. Um, and so I'm really thankful for my time at Good Shepherd, as I will always be. Um, my last note is to spend a lot of time thinking about your supervisor and thinking about what you want that relationship to look like. Um, I think everybody here can probably attest to that. Um, spend a lot of time about what you want that relationship to look like. I was personally looking for somebody that was willing to walk through uh, a discernment process with me and was trustworthy and honest, as I have found. And, um, that's my, my one source of encouragement, is to think really hard about what that supervisory relationship looks like. Thank you. Yeah, I did survive HDS, <laughs> uh, and it was really great. And I, I did my field ed at the infamous University of Lutheran, and that was where I wanted to go and ended up um, going through the ordination process and was ordained about a year ago. Um, and ended up in North Quincy. Um, my congregation, uh, I would say, is a they love their students. And so I inherited a church that has had field education students, not only from HGS, but um, different places um, in, in kind of different forms. And so they were all on board. I mean, they're the ones, they had a kind of, I had to be convinced a little bit by Laura and Emily that I could do this. Um, but my congregation was so excited. Um, and so, for us at Good Shepherd, I would say um, it is dual learning. So Sam comes in and, and hopefully learns a lot from us, uh, but the congregation sees it as learning for them. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the probably, probably gift and curses is that as much as I try and say that Sam is a student, um, they really see her as pastor. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, and, I, and I keep correcting them, you know, she's a student. <laughs> yeah. um, but as soon as she walked in, she wears her collar, and they say, hey, pastor, tell us about this. Mm. And so immediately, um, you could see Sam shift, like, oh, as your pastor, what do I think about this? Um, and not just as a student, not just as Sam, but in that role. Um, so I can give you a little bit of a story is um, we, meet, we meet every week for um, kind of like a Bible study-ish. Vaguely. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and as Sam said, it's sort of this like diverse, kind of quirky group of people that meet. Um, we, different ages, um, different socioeconomic backgrounds, very different political stances. Theologically, we're Lutheran, but kinda. Um, and so we're sitting there and we're talking about this text. Um, from Martin Luther, and um, they're like, you know, pastor, hey, Sam, tell us what you think about this, and Sam kind of goes off on this, like, whole thing about how it's kind of patriarchal, <laughs> and, like, really, like, kind of victorious language, and very how it's diff school fashion, <laughs> yeah. um, and how it just, like, it's kind of very problematic, which Sam and I really actually are on the same page about a lot of things. I kind of watched this interaction happen, um, and they were like so intrigued by her. 
pastor, tell us more. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, you know, the, the discussion opens up to other people, and what you could see Sam like listening to them, and um, and one by one they said how much they loved this awful patriarchal text, <laughs> um, and how much comfort it had given this 80-year-old queer woman mm -hmm. and through her life, which we're like, what, how? <laughs> um, and, and just how beautiful it was and how they loved this powerful image of God. And you could see Sam kind of shift of like, what? Um, and, and I think that is like this dual learning, both from my congregation, they love learning from Sam and this new theology and from her classes, but um, it's, it makes her think, well, how does this actually get played out? in a congregation and pastorally? What is it that they need comfort from? Where do they get that comfort from? And what's what do I press? What do I not press? Mm. Um, and that can be really challenging sometimes for our own identity as, as clergy, as people. Um, so it's fun for my congregation to learn from Sam, but also I think Sam learns a lot from my, uh, my people who are, um, who are just lovely. I think I learn a lot as a supervisor. I think that's the biggest gift you all give to your supervisors is Sam asks like why a whole lot. Mm -hmm. She said, why do you do that? <laughs> like, uh, why do you use that language? Why do you stand that way? Um, why, how, did, how did you know to ask this question to somebody? Um, and then, I ha then I'm sort of forced to answer that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and think about why I do what I do. Um, and sometimes I'm uncomfortable because I don't like what I, I'm like, oh yeah, that's not a good practice. I should <laughs> switch that. Or this is this is why, and um, it may not be you, but it's it's me. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's my big emphasis is that it's it's kind of the, the dual learning, uh, or I guess maybe three prong. It's me as a supervisor learning, Sam as a student learning, and then the congregation learning um, in both ways. So I'm happy to um, talk more. Um, but thanks. Thank you. We, um, we would love to hear your questions. And if, if you're intimidated by the size of the room and so forth, I would just remind you, if you have a question, I guarantee you somebody else is going to be glad you asked it. You ready? Somebody back there? No. Okay. So if you just, okay, yes. Any and all questions, welcome. Yes. <laughs> Oh, okay. And, okay. They didn't, Hi, they didn't my name see. is Courtney. Um, I was just wondering if some of you could speak to the practicalities of a, like a field placement, like hours per week and like what you're actually doing on the ground, mm -hmm. and then kind of what happens after it's over. Like if you're, you're only there and you're really in, ingrained in an organization and you leave, mm -hmm. like how does that work? You, you can speak to that. <laughs> um, it's what, 10 to 15 hours a week? Um, 12 to 15? Mm -hmm. 12 to 15. Um, during and the school year. During the school year. And summer. then summer is 40. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, and then what you do day to day really, really depends. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, Emily and Laura really encouraged me this summer is to really think about um, the learning agreement, which sort of spells out what you're going to do. Um, and, and that involves a uh, hopefully more than one conversation with whoever's gonna be your supervisor. Um, really thinking about like what, uh, treating it as a learning experience, like what do I wanna learn from this? Like what do I, how do I wanna develop from this? And what are, what are the tasks that are gonna enable me, enable me to do that? So for me, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, St. Michael's um, is what we call a high church um, uh, congregation, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's very ritualistic. Um, they take a lot of pride in their worship, and I haven't served in a congregation like that before. Um, so I, a, lo a lot of my hours are on Sunday mornings, you know, um, in, uh, serving on the altar um, and being part of that worship experience. Um, because for me, um, that's how I learn. Um, it, it gives me a different, a different facet of what it means to be a priest in this church um, and, 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 and how I can develop in that way. I can speak a little bit to the, the ending aspect mm -hmm. of things. Uh, 
because I really, I really felt, I really felt that, especially working at a university where kind of the shape of the year is so important. Um, that feeling of like just being there 12 hours a week, um, that you like, you feel you barely get to get your feet under you, and then and then you're gone. <laughs> um, and so that's really real. I've recently been talking to some of my colleagues who've had a similar experience. Um, that feeling of like, oh, you develop a program over the course of the 10 months you're there, and then you, you what? Like you just drop it or you put it on the shoulders of the next field ed student, you know, who's not invested in it in the same way. Um, and my, my friend I was talking to encouraged me to think of it as like, you, you ran a program for a year uh, and you're taking that program with you. So like what types of programs are you going to be wanting to kind of practice for a year and see, you know, and maybe if you'd stayed, maybe if I'd stayed at Suffolk for another year, I could have tried again and worked out some of the kinks and, you know, seen better results. But I, I, I won't be there for another year. Um, but I will be somewhere. Um, and so, like, the programs that I ran, you know, had, like, a, a NONE nuns discussion group. You know, like, maybe Suffolk doesn't have that anymore, but, like, I have the experiences. Um, and so, like, that type of group will exist again um, in whatever organization I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. That's a um, great, great way to put it, I think. Yeah. And can I add just a couple of other things before we turn to another question? Um, realizing some of the things I left out. And one is that you're um, required to do two units, but you can do up to five. There's no restriction on how many you do. And you can start your first semester in field ed. It just happened that nobody on our panel today started their first semester in field ed, but you're encouraged. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric did. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me, Eric. Um, and so you can ask Eric, you know, what was that like to really just start right away? Um, the, Supervision is one hour per week, and it counts as one of your hours. And it is supposed to be theological reflection. And one thing I like to say when I look out at you is I know that many of you, um, some of you are in school right now, but most of you have graduated from undergrad. You're involved either on a volunteer basis or as your full-time work, working somewhere, pouring your heart out, trying to do things, almost none of you gets to reflect on that work with somebody for an hour every week. So that is a huge piece of what makes Field Dead um, educational. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 12 to 15 hours a week. Um, just in terms of a couple other nuts and bolts that uh, dovetail into this, um, there is structure woven throughout. So there's a bit of, uh, not, not a bit, there's a bunch of paperwork <laughs> uh, at the front end. We torment you with yeah. paperwork. <laughs> Which um, is really just to hold you accountable, all parties accountable, um, supervisor and student and HDS. Uh, but that entails writing, drafting a learning agreement as well, which uh, theoretically would set out clear aims of like, I have this concern that I'm going to get deeply embedded in this community and then I'm going to leave a vacuum when I go. And so then as a part of your learning agreement, you can say, how can we structure your learning in a way that doesn't leave our community in a lurch when you leave, for example. So a lot of that work is that they force you to think about these kinds of things. Oh, that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. No worries. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, this moment with you all today. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, I have perhaps a very... Um, metaphoric question, I suppose. Uh, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, a couple of you already mentioned uh, the fact that our churches are dying and our church life is dying. Um, and so I'm really intrigued by your perspectives as people looking to go into church life, um, what it is like to, to think about having a life in something that is dying. Um, and as I think it was Isaac, you said, um, the path to greater life and greater love comes through death. I'm wondering, and again, I apologize for the metaphors, um, how do we die well, and how do we continue the practice of, of resurrection in our religious and spiritual life? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll go. <laughs> Um, I actually, uh, this might be an unpopular opinion, I actually disagree strongly that the church is dying, um, <laughs> but I use that, I guess, metaphorically as well in that our numbers are dying, um, and I am a firm believer in quality over quantity, and um, 
I think we're changing. Mm -hmm. We're changing really dramatically. And part of that for me is, this is just something I've, I've been personally interested in for a while, is if, if we're changing, then our education needs to change with it. Uh, we can't keep sending pastors, uh, in my case, to schools for six, five, six years with loans and in this traditional setting if when they come out they're going to be bivocational and they're going to be in a different setting. And so for me, it's, it's how do we use these small communities that are doing really great work and, and figure out how to make them more sustainable and figure out not only that, but how, how they also see themselves as valuable. One of my experiences um, at, at the congregation I'm at is just they're, they're really concerned that the church is dying and they're concerned that they're going to go away too. And that's a fair concern, but also they're really valuable. <laughs> they do such good work and they're so loving and they're so quirky and eccentric and wonderful. And they have so much to give to this church too that, that if we can shift that focus from these numbers and from the idea that we're dying and look at these things that are that are happening that are really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that for me comes in this empowerment and making sure that these communities know that they're valued and know that they're loved and know that they're worth my time of being mm -hmm. in school for six years or being in school for longer. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, yeah, I, I don't think the church is dying. <laughs> um, and I wish that we could find a way to make sure communities know that mm -hmm. and to, if they're going to die out, to die a good death and a healthy death and, and know that there is life after death as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's mine. Yeah, yeah that's I great. Yeah. Go ahead, Isaac. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with Sam. Um, it depends how you define dying and HGS is very good at teaching us different ways of defining things. <laughs> Um, <laughs> ministry, for example. Um, uh, talk to the first years who are in theories and methods. They can tell you all about this. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, traditional seminaries um, are, are part of this decline. Um, and, uh, and I think H HGS is just so unique in, in a multiple ways, you know, the, the, the conversation partners you're able to have that just um, transcends all kinds of boundaries um, and and the resources that are available here, which allow you to to really imagine, you know, uh, uh, the church may be dying, uh, but the gospel isn't going to die. Um, and I firmly believe that. And, and so what is it, uh, no matter what Christianity, the Christian tradition, the way of Jesus looks like um, in the future, is going to look like gathered community. Um, and is going to need people to gather those communities. And so, um, you know, I am I'm, I'm going to be an evangelist. I think I see myself as an evangelist for sending as many future um, uh, ordained leaders through places like HDS um, because uh, because ideas come from talking to people who you know aren't in your thirty person congregation. Um, you know, they come from people who are, you know, pursuing uh, UU ordination and going to be a, a college chaplain or, or figuring out what it means to be um, an ethical um, person in, in, in the medical industrial complex. And so, um, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's scary. I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I look and it's like, mm, where's my you know, where's my paycheck going to come from? Or, For real. <laughs> like, <laughs> I took a job. Uh, but that's where I think. Uh, colleagues and mentors come in to just remind you of just the utter importance of this work um, and and to give you the encouragement to keep going and and trusting that, that you have what it takes to figure it out um, and I think that has been such an important gift from HDS that um, yeah I would undercount mm -hmm. Hi, my name is uh, Derek and uh, thank you all um, I love to find people in my life that have a heart for service. And thank you for you know, the opportunities that have been created for you, and that seems like a fantastic value of this place um, to help you challenge ideas and whatever else. But um, can you speak specifically to how the MDiv has uh, better prepared you uh, to provide pastoral care or to chaplaincy and these sorts of, uh, beyond kind of tricking fantastic people into taking you on, uh, or whatever they're, you know, creating these sort of opportunities. What is the program itself? I mean, the classes, we have an opportunity to sit in on our, you know, hieroglyphics and ancient Greek. And yeah. th they're not to that process. 
you know, what, what does that part of the program look like? Um, I can only speak to my experience, of course. Um, so there's, there's a lot of answers to this question, which are both generative and critique, right? Um, which I think any worthwhile educational experience should be, in my opinion. Um, but for me, what the MDiv has done in, in concrete terms, in, in myriad ways, is it has added um, a profound sense of awe f at the complexity of human experience. Um, and like this sort of embodied visceral notion that my only sort of option in the face of such complexity is like a deep humility, um, which is constantly practiced, right? Like in my embodiment and whatever else, it's like constant, this is my spiritual practice of like being humble in the face of what I don't know, what I haven't known before, and what I probably can never know. Um, and how other people are constructing meaning in the face of suffering. Um, and so just learning how to respond from that place and sort of de-triggering the fear response that comes from like being unsure <laughs> and um, trying to find that sort of uncertainty, you know, Buddhist hat, like not knowing of like, um, <laughs> is, is perhaps a certain kind of freedom um, I was actually in an MDiv program, a more Buddhist-centric one, before I came here, and then I transferred out. And there was a lot of certainty. Um, and I felt like I was missing something. Um, there's the only thing, even, you know, justice is a certain kind, of, and care is a certain kind of certainty that is in this space. But what justice and care looks like, community to community and resource to resource, um, yeah, the work of discerning and moving through complexity is, feels like it's never done. And so that's how I'm trying to approach things. <laughs> Attempting. <laughs> so the, I, I um, believe this is our last question for the panel. Thank you. Um, clinical chaplaincy. Can, somebody, can you all or one of you speak to the variety of uh, options available there? Specifically, clinical meaning like hospital chaplaincy? Well, I don't or? Know. That's <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think of clinical referring to medical chaplaincy. Um, but there are other chaplaincies. Obviously, I worked at, as a university chaplain as well. Um, there are people here trained to be military chaplains, although I don't know of anyone who did field ed for that. Uh, it, it's been done, but um, not a lot. And then there's also prison chaplaincy. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. But in terms of more minutia, like my clinical placement wasn't a CPE placement, which meant it was much more informal than yeah. the kind of experience um, that Sally went through, which um, is just, you know, depending on how structured do you want your clinical experience to be. And my hospital was just too small to run a CPE mm -hmm. program, but it was still a clinical experience. Um, but I didn't get a credit of CPE. Mm -hmm. Like put in the box. Yeah, so CPE credits are for um, people, sometimes your ordination process requires a yeah. CPE credit, um, or if you plan to be a hospital chaplain, you need a certain number of CPE credits um, in order to uh, be uh, board certified, board certified right. as, a, as a hospital chaplain. Um, and so the CPE programs in the area are at Brigham and Women's and uh, Hebrew Senior Life. Uh, and those can be over the summer, or they can be residencies, which are through the, the school year. And MGH will have, and Beth Israel. Cool. Um, and so I think that's uh, um, all the time we have. But I, Derek, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more specifically about the MDiv curriculum. Um, much to say about that, but no time to kind of get into it in depth. <laughs> And thank you again for the honor of being with you during this hour. Thank you very much. And thank you, panel.